Hey folks, welcome back to the Portable Gamer. Welcome back to Farming Simulator 17. Welcome back to Coldborough Park Farm. This is exactly, like really exactly where we stopped last week. And I decided because Field 7, is it Field 7? Yeah, Field 7. Because Field 7 is so much fun to try to sort out, I thought, let's sort it out. You know, let's do that on camera. And I don't know, I don't know if I've ever, in all the time that I've been doing this, I don't know if I've ever taken a field like all the way through, you know what I mean? From like beginning to end, as far as harvesting, not a big deal. Get our 1660 going, not a big deal, but you know what I'm saying. Now, here's the problem about field seven. If we look, you can barely see it from here, but way over in the far corner over there by the timber area, the field is steep enough that we, we can't really go up it and we can't really even go across it. So what I'm trying to figure out is what is the... What's the quickest way we can do this with a minimum of, of deadheading? I mean, because what we could do is just like repeatedly take wax at one side of it. You know what I mean? Um, or we could like go roundy roundy, but the problem is that um, I don't want to describe this. The problem is if we if we go roundy roundy, at a certain point we're going to I wouldn't say have problems, but at a certain point because the field is like compound, I guess. You know what I mean? It's got a lot of uh, because it kind of wraps around a hill. Regardless of where we start, at a certain point, we'll be going side hill, I think. Yeah, that's the best way to explain it. So it's like we, we either have to go side hill or we have to try to go up this monster hill or we have to deadhead. And what I'm trying to figure out is how do we, how do we keep that to a minimum? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. So that's what we're going to try to do this week. And I thought, well, let's do it on camera. You know, I, I've been kind of skipping ahead a little bit, not a ton. But let's at least get this field solved on camera. So that's what we're going to do. And um, yeah, it's weird to be back on the farm. I've been spending, I've been spending some time in shooter games, which I didn't think I would do. And I can't say that I didn't want to do it, but... I am, I am in many ways uh, sort of not interested in violence. I'm, I'm sort of over violence. I've seen enough of it. I don't need to see any more. And then I kind of remind myself, well, I mean, it is a video game. And, and uh, you know, I thought the division was going to be more of a tactical shooter. I, I really was not anticipating the RPG aspect of it. It really wasn't. And it's, it's cartoony. It, it is, uh, particularly when you're doing multiplayer co-op. And if you want the good drops, if you want the good loot, you got to go on Legendary with a team of four, myself and three others. And, you know, the final boss monsters are, they're cartoony boss monsters, like, like you'd have in an RPG game. So you have four, four people, four heavily armed people just pouring magazine after magazine of of bullets into this boss and it takes you know 12 or 15 or 30 seconds of that so really not at all realistic I mean I don't think a I don't think a structure could stand up to that sort of assault or a vehicle or something I think that would you know what I mean I think that would melt quite a few buildings not like skyscrapers but you know what I mean like a house if you had if you had four people just like raining automatic weapon fire on a house, brick or not, it would, it would do some damage. So certainly no, no human being could stand up to that. But that's cool. It's a video game. You know, it's not a documentary. But it's still, it was not what I expected. It's good. It's fun. But it was not what I expected. So what I did was, see what had happened was, what I did was I went ahead and downloaded uh, uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands. And I have to say, Ghost Recon Wildlands is kind of the game that I was looking for when I got... Why is it so hard for me to, like, line this up? This is the second time this happened. Happened last week as well. 
trying to line up this 90 degree turn. It's tricky with the, with the header out in front of us. We're real farmers. You have my respect. So this is the very steep, very steep part of the field. So I, I was not convinced that Ghost Recon's, Ghost Recon's, only a singular Ghost Recon. I was not entirely convinced that Ghost Recon Wildlands would run on my machine at all. But then I realized I wasn't convinced that the Division would either. But the Division runs just fine. Uh, pretty good settings. And I'm holding 60 FPS, so I thought, eh, why not? I'll give it a try. It's not on sale. That sucked. But, eh, we'll give it a try. And it does run fine. I'm on, uh, most of my settings are, are uh, medium. I have a few high in there. And I'm at about 30 to 40 FPS. So it's really, the Division was released in 2016. So I figure I can, I can handle that. Ghost Recon Wildlands was released in 2017. And that's really pushing the, pushing the limits of my Wii gaming laptop. But it does run, and it looks pretty. I'm able to, I don't have to completely potato the settings. I can, I can have a little, a little pretty in there. And, uh, and it is the game that I wanted The Division to be in terms of, it's not entirely a stealth game. There's some pretty, there's some pretty intense bursts of combat, but there's a lot of stealth. Uh, there's a lot of planning. You have, whether you play solo or co-op, you play as a team. You're not truly solo as you are in the division. And you can, when you're playing solo, you can control the other members of your of your team, your squad. And uh, and it's great fun. It's it's what I it's what I thought the division would be. The only problem is it's in Bolivia rather than wintertime post-apocalyptic New York and that was the thing that really caught my eye about the, the division when I first saw the trailer for it a few years ago that landscape just absolutely blew me away and so I was uh, not disappointed I mean it is what it is uh, it was it was not what I expected but it's, it's a fun game I mean I've put plenty of hours into it in the past month and uh, my only the only downside is there's it's an RPG game so there's no real end game it just it just tapers, right? And you get into the diminishing return of chasing and, and grinding for more and more rare drops. You know, you have everything you want as far as gear and equipment and upgrades. You have everything you want, so all that's left to do really is grind for the things you don't have. And that's, I've talked about this. I hate to repeat myself, but I've talked about this in, in previous sim videos I've talked about the fact that you get caught in a kind of an addictive loop with those games where you need to upgrade your character so you can do harder missions so you can get better gear so you can upgrade your character so you can do better missions and it's uh, you know it is what it is Ghost Recon Wildlands on the other hand is not and it's more of a it is it is open world it is um uh, Games, big games are, are crazy. Big open world games are crazy compared to how linear, even five or six years ago, how linear shooters were, where something like uh, Modern Warfare or, uh, or Medal of Honor, you know, you really, they made it clear, very clear where you were supposed to go. And you really couldn't go any place other than that. You'd run off the edge of the map. The map was it was less of a map and it was more like a maze you know and the maze had scenery on the left and the right to make it appear that you were in a big open world but really you were just going through a maze and it was a very narrow maze and that was really all you could do and with with these big open world games now you know red dead redemption 2 i think is probably going to win game of the year for 2018 that I never played it. I watched people play it. That looked amazing. But a big open world like that, where you can do whatever you want, you know, and playing Ghost Recon Wildlands, it's it's I just did the first the first few missions. I haven't even really gone into the game that deep at all. But it, it's if there's a structure or a building and there's bad guys in it, what do you want to do? You know, you can come at it from any angle. You can 
you can come at it from a distance, you can stealth it, you can rush it, you can, you know, it, it's, um, you can post your team like up on a hillside and have them engaged from a distance and you can, or you can send them in to engage and you can overwatch and snipe. It's really, there's just so much, uh, it's very interpretive. It's very uh, personal, I guess. And of course, all these, all these Sims have a character building model. Well, no, no, I take that back. Because Ubisoft Paris also did, did they do uh, Assassin's Creed? Was it Ubisoft Paris or Ubisoft Montreal? Oh, whoever it was. Not a lot of character building there because you're playing as a specific person. But most of these Sims, well, see, there I go calling them Sims. They're not Sims at all, they're games. I don't know that that's necessarily something you would want to simulate, but I know I've said in the past that all gaming is simulation gaming. Conversation for another day. Anyway, most of these games now, the character building is really, really detailed and intense down to like specific pieces of, of name brand gear, like actual manufacturer's gear, some of which I have in real life, which is very weird and very cool at the same time. But bottom line, you can really personalize your character. And then you can personalize the way that you play the game. And I think this is, you know, for as long as I've been in gaming and, and how I've seen gaming evolve over the years, I really do think that, you know, as we get into this, this next phase of gaming, uh, where we're really pushing the limits of, you know, blurring the line between between uh, entertainment and reality. I really think it, that it's just, it's such an amazing time to be in gaming, and I'm glad I got back into it when I did, I have to say. Uh, lifted my header a little too early. Let's go back and get that last little bit. that I ran over then and crushed and it wasn't there for us to get. Right, get that last little bit. How are we doing? We're about two thirds of the way full. I don't think we could make another trip around. Uh, let's do this. Let's hop out of, let's hop out of the cab and let's, uh, let's go back across the top of this field. And it, I don't know if you can see what I'm saying when I'm talking about side hill, but as we, yeah, we're already, we're already getting to that point. As we gradually like work off the, the top of this hill and continue to take lengths off this side right now where we're working, we will get into that side hill. So this is what I mean when I say it's like, it's tricky, man. It really is. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a devious field, if there can be such a thing. I suppose there could be. So what I'm saying is it's a fascinating time to be in gaming, and I wonder where it's going to go. You know, I, I know the things that I've seen change in my lifetime have just been unbelievable. And... You know, as far as technology, communication, uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday about, you know, the big quantum changes in, in communication for the human race, really, not just like for any country or any culture, but like for the, for the planet. And they say that the, the first transatlantic telegraph cable was a really big deal because what that meant was, that was put in what, like the 1880s? And what that meant was, save game, what that meant was that if you were born in 1840, in 1840 it took a couple of weeks to cross the Atlantic. It took a couple of weeks, literally a couple of weeks to get a message from the UK to the United States. It's, right, it's almost impossible to think about that. It's almost impossible to imagine that. Really? I mean, I can remember when I was a kid, when I was just tiny, I can remember with my dad on Saturday, we would go to the big Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh, where I grew up, to look something up. You know, if there was something that had come up during the week that you wanted to look up, you would literally like write it down on a piece of paper 
and then my dad and I would go to the library. He always had stuff that he needed to research for work, and there might be something that I was curious about. So we'd go in the morning and we'd, we'd uh, look stuff up. No joke, we would like look stuff up at the library. And then we would go to either the Museum of Natural History or the, uh, the Scape Gallery, the art galleries. And that was what you did. And now it's like if you want to look something up, you just, you just tap on your smartphone. And right, it's weird to think about, I mean, those were good times with my dad, but it's weird to think about how many hours you spend because to get from our house where we live to the library took, I don't know, probably 15, 20 minutes. We lived in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, so we were sort of, I mean, not on the, not on the wrong side of town to get to the library, but we, we weren't close to it. But it took a while to get there. It took a while to get parked, you know, and then it took a while to, like, find the books that you needed, especially if they were, uh, like, collected books that they had to bring from the stacks for you or things that you couldn't take take home with you, couldn't take away. If it was something, if it was a book you could take with you, right, you take that home. But if it was a book that, like, had to stay in the library, you had to find what you needed to find, like, in the library and then put that put that book back, give that book back to them. So I think about all the hours that it took to do that. And you contrast that now with, you know, being able to do that same thing in just a few minutes. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I've seen that happen in my lifetime. So I think about a person born in, say, 1840. And when they were born, it took a couple of weeks to get a message from the UK to the United States. Literally a couple of weeks. There was no faster way to do it. And they put this cable in. And now you could do that same thing in an hour or two and I understand you know electricity speed of light instantaneous I get it but I'm saying you know as far as as far as not translating it but you know what I mean you gotta you gotta put it in there you gotta type it in there tap it out so say an hour you know and to go from a couple of weeks to an hour that is quantum I mean, that is absolutely a quantum change in the speed of communication between those two locations. And somebody saw that in their lifetime. You know, somebody in, in one lifetime, they sent a message, it would be a letter, I suppose. They sent a letter from one side to the other, and it took a couple of weeks. And at, at the, maybe not the end of their life, but then later in their life, they sent a message, and it was there a couple hours later. I don't know what that, that cost. That was probably the equivalent of hundreds or thousands of dollars in today's money to have access to that technology. But, you know what I mean? And it's uh, this one, yeah. So, I think about gaming the same way. Now, obviously, gaming is not going to have the same kind of impact on you know, people around the planet as that type of communication did. But it's, it's going to happen. And I, I don't know, I mean... And again, you know, I, I try not to get political on the channel. I don't talk about politics. But, you know, geopolitics and politics are two different things. You know, uh, those socio-political and almost anthropological issues, things that affect us all as human beings. And as automation comes online and as more and more jobs become more efficient and less and less people are needed, there's this sort of uh, ongoing debate about what we're going to do for money. You know, we can't all just mow each other's lawns. Like, what are we going to do when the robots take over? What are, what are they going to need us for? Now, Skynet may just kill us all because it doesn't need us for anything. But there's like serious conversations going on in places where they discuss serious things like this about, you know, sustained 15 and 18 and 30 percent unemployment in a in a modern country, like in a developed nation, I'm not talking about like a developing country, I'm talking like first world. What are we gonna do? You know, what are we gonna do? And one of the suggestions, one of the solutions is, we're gonna entertain ourselves so we don't riot. And I think, okay, all right, what are we gonna entertain ourselves with? Well, obviously the sex robots, those will be here soon. But, you know, you gotta, you gotta mix and match a little bit. And I, I think about gaming and I think, 
you know, is the, is the evolution and the development of gaming being driven by a realization that at some point, we're all going to have a lot of free time and we we better have something to do in that time or no joke people will will riot they'll cause problems so is this all a way of uh getting us used to being sort of distracted and sort of docile because the the immersive quality of these games i'm telling you i i know uh you know, you can look at any point in history and when you apply a contemporary lens to it, it's like, well, you know, obviously they weren't as into what they were doing as we're into what what it is that we're doing because what we're doing is so much cooler. And I think, no, man, it's, it's the state of the art depends on the state of the art. So, you know, there, there are very impressive buildings today, but you can walk into an old cathedral 500, 600 years old. And it to this day, those places will blow your mind. They are absolutely astounding. And I think we're cynical and postmodern and we're not easily impressed. And that's impressive. And I think, what if you went back in time 500 years and somebody, right, with no education, with, with none of the things that we have. I mean, think how people lived 500 years ago. Think of a just a, a, a peasant, I guess. And I'm not using that word. I'm not being disparaging when I use that word. I'm just, that's, that's who I'm talking about. Think of a peasant 500 years ago going to a city for the first time. They've literally never been to a city before in their life and they get there and there's a cathedral, right? Now, if that cathedral can blow your mind today, imagine what it did for that person. That'd be like walking into a goddamn spaceship, it, right? That would be absolutely astounding. So everything needs to be kept in context, I think. And to look at something... I'm going for it, by the way. I don't know if you picked up on that. Everything needs to be kept in context. And I think, you know, when you hear about people, like, losing their effing minds about War of the Worlds when that was broadcast in, what, the 1930s? Like, people were into stuff. They were into things just as much as we're into things. It just looks so sort of quaint and nostalgic now because that certainly wouldn't do it for us today. If that makes sense. I think it does. So, come on. There it goes. So, I don't know. I don't know what's, what's going to happen, but I know it is, it really is amazing to see the, no, no, what just happened? That goes there, that goes there, there we go. It really has been amazing to see just in my lifetime, and even really it's accelerated, I think, in the past five years, eight years. I think uh, the Grand Theft Auto games had a lot to do with, with driving things forward. I think Assassin's Creed had a lot to do with driving things forward. Uh, uh, was it Skyrim? Is it the Elder Scrolls? I may not know what I'm talking about there, but yeah, Skyrim. Yeah, Skyrim. Games that really sort of uh, changed the the genre, the industry, that really moved things forward. And I think it's, you know, you, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. I think once people have been exposed to almost photorealistic graphics, you know, there's still the Fortnite run, every video game with that type of movement, the characters are all doing a Fortnite run where they're sort of moonwalking forward, you know, they'll get that sorted. There's, a, there's quite a bit of that in the division when you do multiplayer. A lot of the Fortnite high step. But whatever, you know, it'll get there. It'll get there. And uh, it's, like I said, it's just crazy to see it in my lifetime. It's crazy to think about the games that I was playing when I was a kid and contrast them with what I'm playing now and just... Are you kidding me? Man. So... So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But I'm digging uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands, and it's massive. It's I would say it's probably as big as... What was the last big one? Assassin's Creed Odyssey was massive, right? Like, you, you see the map, and you're like, oh, shoot, that's a pretty big map. And then you, you zoom out, and you realize that what you were looking at that you thought was big is, like, one, one area of the map. And there's, like, 15 other areas like that, and each of them has 
you know, eight or 10 or 12 missions and, and it's all open world. You can just, if you want to, you can just drive from one side of the map to the other, like one side of the full play area to the other. I don't know what it'll take you, probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but that's, uh, I think a lot of that came from, really came from, uh, from GTA and that big world they created where you could, you know, go anywhere and do anything. Now, I'm curious. I don't think it's going to happen, although it could. It could because who was the, uh, oh, some gangster from, uh, I don't know where they were from. I don't know what their location was, but I know some gangster converted GTA 5 into, instead of being a bad guy, you're a good guy. It's like the, the Los Santos Tactical Response Squad or something. I don't know, but it's uh, instead of playing as a as a bad guy doing bad stuff, you play as a cop. So they like rewrote the missions and, and recrafted the characters. And again, it's like it's like uh, it's like seasons for farm sim or pro mods for for Euro Truck. It's like man, what balls you must have to look at a game like this and be like, you know what? I think I can completely change that. Just me, uh, maybe me and my crew. You know, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go to the developer and like, fork a bunch of money at them and, and call myself a producer and say that I want to create a, a DLC. No, I'll just do it myself and then I'll give it away. Man, that is, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine looking at something like Euro Truck, and saying, you know what, I bet I could totally change this. Right, let's do it. And then they just did it. Uh, that. That blows my mind. And somebody did the same thing on a on a pretty grand scale with uh, GTA V. So who knows? But I would love to see the Ghost Recon Wildlands style realistic stealth gameplay in The Division. And The Division 2, I have to say, there's several reasons why it's not super appealing to me. One of them is I know my machine will not be able to play it. Like, I was worried about Division 1. I did okay. I was worried about Ghost Recon Wildlands. I did okay. But I am 100% certain that my machine will not play the Division 2. Uh, maybe on, like, ultra potato setting. But what fun is that? You know, a gorgeous game like that. What fun is it to go potato? So... Uh, no possibility of playing that. That's one problem. And then the other problem is, the other problem is, it's Washington, D.C. in the summertime. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to D.C. in the summertime. Even if there was not, like, a global epidemic and everybody was dead, Washington, D.C. in the summertime is miserable. D.C. is a swamp, basically. I don't get political up in here. I'm talking, like, geographically, right? Like, it's a swamp. It's a tidal basin. It's been all filled in over the years, but it's a swamp. And uh, I don't know why they decided to build the Capitol there, sort of tangentially. I don't know who looked at, at a swamp and was like, you know what? I bet if we put enough dirt in here, we could like raise the level of the of the area, and then we could we could build buildings here. I don't know why you wouldn't just go someplace that was not a swamp. Oh. Founding Fathers, man, they're really smart in some ways and then other ways, like, what the hell? Anyway, so even without a pandemic, it's a swamp, man. It's hot and muggy and mosquitoes, and it's just, it's not a very pleasant place. And I really, you know, watching the, the first trailers that are coming out and the, the YouTubers that have been able to uh, play the beta uh, and do some videos for it, it, it looks very similar. Uh, it looks like, you know, there's some things that are different about the HUD, as there always are, from one one generation of a game to the next. It seems like that's the thing that that changes the most consistently is it's always the HUD. But the gameplay looks very similar. And I don't know. I mean, could it have been a DLC? Maybe. Maybe. But, uh, but they released it as a full game, and it just, it has no appeal. I mean, because the gameplay is so similar, and because it's not New York in the winter... And because it is DC in the summer, and because my machine wouldn't play it, not interested. Maybe down the road a ways. Uh, hopefully, I mean, I waited three years, uh, not on purpose, but I waited three years to get the Division One, and uh, maybe I'll wait three years to get the Division Two, and by then I'll have a much better machine, 
hopefully, hopefully, and uh, and it'll just fire right up. So who knows? We'll see. But in the meantime, uh, I think Ghost Recon Wildlands is going to keep me plenty busy. It is, uh, it's a very different gameplay experience than The Division, which itself is a very different gameplay experience than any of the Sims that I'm in. I mean, obviously, it is. Uh, talking about a, an RPG shooter versus, uh, versus driving a combine harvester. But, you know, it's uh, a little bit of variety. And I did, uh, I, I did talk with my advisory board for the channel and ask about bringing something like a tactical shooter in for an episode for a, a series and the consensus was no absolutely not i feel like i've got an older audience that really is an end of the shoot 'em up style and i feel like my presentation and commentary would not really resonate with the kids that are into those kinds of games so it's it's a non-starter that's strictly going to be something that i do just to kind of I don't know, keep myself from getting bored. I don't, I don't necessarily get bored with a game, but there are times when it's a little, hmm, uh, what's a good word for it? You know what I mean? It, it doesn't quite feel like work, but it starts to sort of feel like work. And it's weird with all these industrial simulations that we do because they are work. You know, <laughs> owning a farm, working on a farm, that's work. Driving a truck is work. Driving a train is work. So, and they, I've seen these all called, all referred to as a genre as work sims. So, you know, interesting. Although, although, there's that OCD again. Although, if you're a, if you're a spec op soldier, that's your work, you know? So I guess in a way that's a work sim too. But that, that goes back to, to the original point, which is all gaming is sim gaming. But you know what I mean. You always know what I mean. So we're gonna go to the end here. I think we're gonna flip around and not trim this short headland length off. So we don't need to do a three point turn. We're just gonna lift the header, flip it 180 degrees, drive up the other side, tip, and I think that'll put us right at about 30 minutes. So that'll be perfect. So yeah, I wanted to uh, keep working on this field on camera. It's a, it's a fun field, it is. Uh, I know it seems like we're just going roundy roundy, but it's it's uh, it's a little trickier than that, especially as we do get into that side hill proper, which we will, I don't know, this episode, we didn't, next episode we should, maybe, you want to you harvest the same field three episodes in a row, why not, why not, man, let's do it, let's do it, and you may have noticed, I barely noticed, because it happens very slowly, but I've got the dead zones on my sticks set very very low the dead zones on my thumbsticks and as a result particularly the camera very slowly creeps the view very slowly changes and it's hard to spot because you can lock or unlock the camera to the horizon and I have it unlocked so every time the vehicle moves the camera sort of flexes around with it and then when it comes back to where it was, you don't always notice that it doesn't come back to where it was because it's very slowly, very slowly moving. But I try to keep an eye on that. What what happens sometimes is I forget. I'm like concentrating on something else and I look down and the camera's like up here. Fix that camera, Will. All right, all right, all right. So, I mean, I suppose I could bump at least the camera thumbsticks. I could bump the dead zone out a little bit so when they come back on center, they're not moving the camera. I could do that. I suppose I could do that. Right. We're going to get up here. We're going to be just about full. Full enough that we can tip, I think. Yeah. Yep. And I'm not going to swerve out for the tree again. So we trim off this little, this little bit on the end here. Get rid of that. Beautiful. Shut her down. All right. Still rolling. Yeah, it, 1660 does not like, does not even like that hill. And that hill on the other side is much steeper. So I, I think we're doing the right thing here. I think. 
Um, I mean, I don't just want to deadhead back and forth and continually go down that hill. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I'll think about it this week. When we come back next week, we'll take a crack at it. But I will not do this for all the fields on the farm. We'll just do this for field seven, and then the rest of them I'll probably finish off camera, and our next evolution will most likely be grass work. Oh, I swung that really, really. That makes me happy. I did that just right. Beautiful. Right there. Set the break. I don't want to do the same thumbnail two weeks in a row. Or do I? Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I will. Folks, thanks for stopping back to check out the Portable Gamer. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Farming Simulator 17 from Coldborough Park Farm. We'll see you next time. Take care now.